Welcome to the Maria Heller Show, the Internet's original podcast. Since the year 2000, always ahead of the curve, always on your side. A true warrior for truth and justice, Maria and her guests leave nothing out and no one is off limits. There is only one truth, the rest is lies. Sit back, enjoy the education with a true daughter of Mother Earth. Sharp New York wit, spiritual knowing, and a very dry sense of humor, Maria will dissect the news and lies to make it all palatable. Education is power. Uh, good morning, world. Maria here, alive and kicking. Welcome to News of Planet of the Apes. And believe me, there's plenty of it. Just a few announcements. Tomorrow's Roaring Truth with Jim Fetzer. I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about, as usual. And tonight at 6 p.m. Pacific time, I will be the uh, guest on Chuck Ocelli's show. So you'll want to tune in to that. And Chuck and I usually have plenty to say as well. Anyway, so much stuff going on in the news. I'm just going to get to it. By now, you know about the shooting of the five Dallas police officers that were dead. Uh, but when you have a standing army, and if you've noticed any of the video of these protests throughout the country... It really is frightening. I mean, the cops look like they're in Fallujah, not in the cities of America, trying to get their race war started. And of course, everybody's feeling sorry for the cops. I do too. I mean, this is everybody fighting against each other while the rulers laugh all the way to the bank. So they're getting what they want. Non-participation is always key, as I continue to remind people. But don't think that since those cops were shot that they haven't killed more Americans. It wasn't just the two men that were shot the week before. And uh, when you look at not only did they test out uh, transhumanism on us by sending a robot in to blow the man up that supposedly shot the cops, and of course then they found the manifesto, they found all kinds of weapons in his house, he wrote RB in blood on the walls of where they supposedly blew him up. This is the beginning of RoboCop. You know, when you look at movies, remember predictive programming, and so many people thought it was such a great idea to send that robot in and blow him up, but whatever happened to due process in America, or the truth, we'll never know the truth because dead men tell no tales. That plus the fact, first there were multiple snipers, and then they reduced it to a lone gunman, as usual. Where do we hear these stories? I mean, he's got every single piece of a false flag staged event around him. And after serving a year in Afghanistan, trained to be a killer and his mind destroyed, I'm sure, by having to perform inhuman acts on other humans, who knows what the real deal is and we'll never know now because they decided to use AI to take him out. And that's just the beginning of what they have in store for all of us. So God help any of us if we're driving down the street with a traffic violation. So let's get to the news, okay? Because these are stories you're not going to hear anywhere else. A homeless man was left in a coma after he had an encounter with the Anaheim police and he died. The family of Vincent Valenzuela, a homeless man with mental health problems, ended life support a week after an incident with Anaheim police where they left him in a coma. It's very similar comparisons to when they killed Kelly Thomas and his fatal beating by the Fullerton police. Remember when he was crying out for his dad as they were killing him? Well, Valenzuela died five years to the day that Thomas passed away from his injuries. What exactly happened, we don't really know. Cops are being tight-lipped. They only said they got a call about a suspicious man following a woman to her home and that they activated a taser even though they won't admit that they used it. They said he engaged the officers in a physical confrontation, and while they were trying to arrest him, he went into medical distress. Valenzuela was a 32-year-old father of two children. He had been able to move his extremities earlier last week, but he got worse and worse. He stopped breathing, and he died. Uh, The the, uh, family decided to pull the plug because he couldn't breathe without the help of a ventilator. His family's retained legal services of Garo Mardirosian, who's the attorney who handled both the Kelly Thomas murder and civil trial. And no cops went to jail for that. So let's go to another one. Let's go down to Norfolk, in the city of Norfolk, home of Beauties and War Talk. 
Video of Norfolk officers shooting and killing a man can remain secret forever, thanks to their state law. As new videos of fatal shootings by cops led to protests and calls for reform across the country, the public's yet to see body camera footage of Norfolk police killing a man more than a month ago. Under city policy and state law, the video may never become public. The new mayor says he wants it released or at least shown to the media, but that won't mean diddly squat. While the world knows the names of the officers who killed the men in Louisiana and Minnesota last week, the Norfolk police have refused to name the two who fired at 43-year-old Willie James on June 2nd. Norfolk Police Chief Michael Goldsmith said James lunged at officers with a knife before they fired, and when he wouldn't discuss what the body camera video shows, he said it supports officers' accounts. Of course it does, because officers kill with impunity and immunity now. And the police say they won't release any video connected to a criminal investigation, and the same goes for officers' names. So that's two more dead that you didn't hear about. So let's get to the third. Protesters demand justice after release of Brooklyn Road Rage shooting video. Hundreds took to the streets of Manhattan last night. It was more like a thousand people. Demanding an end to nationwide systematic racism and police brutality in the wake of three widely publicized killings of black men by law enforcement officers. The Standing Army, okay. Saturday's protest was led by Zayanella Vines, the nephew of Delron Small, who was shot and killed, by an off-duty cop during a Brooklyn Road Rage incident last week. Small, 37, was shot by off-duty cop Wayne Isaacs in East New York on the 4th of July. The newly released surveillance video shows Small exiting his car and rushing at Isaacs' car. Despite earlier claims that Small had repeatedly punched Isaacs, the footage revealed as he approached the officer's window, he was shot immediately. Isaacs was placed on administrative duty and, oh, an investigation's going on as if that's going to go anywhere. I remember investigation in Orwellian speak means cover-up. Anyway, uh, Vine said of this of his uncle's killer. He says he needs to be in jail. He needs to be stripped from his titles. And it needs to happen ASAP because my uncle is dead. He, uh, uh, one of the protesters expressed her sympathy for Vine. She said, I feel like he shouldn't have to protest because his family died at the hands of those that are pledged to protect us. Police are supposed to protect our community, but all they're doing is killing our community. She said she once considered being a police officer, but said she couldn't do it now. She says, how could I? If not all cops are bad, where are the good ones in time of needs? True question. So let's get on to another cop killing. Police said they shot a man because he pointed a gun at him, but the video showed he had his hands up. No gun. Another black man shot and killed by police in Texas Saturday morning. Houston police said Alva Brazil was waving a gun and pointed it at them when they opened fire, but surveillance footage from a nearby gas station suggests otherwise. See, when you live in a surveillance society, surveillance works both ways, and photography is not a crime. The video shows Brazil walked out towards an intersection when the squad car arrived. He put his hands in the air, turns around, stands still for a few seconds before police executed him. Both officers had body cameras on them, but the footage not released yet. And this is going on after the recorded videos showing the cops shooting black men in Minnesota and Louisiana and Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, who now they're trying to backstory, make them look like criminals, like they deserved it. And in the midst of the outcry over those killings, a dozen officers in Dallas were attacked by a sniper while protecting a protest, five of them killed. It's not clear whether or not Brazil had a gun or if he threatened police. Police protocol encourages officers to use lethal force if they feel someone's threatening them, but there's many other tools and opportunities they have to de-escalate a situation. For example, in a majority white neighborhood of Houston this weekend, an armed suspect fired seven rounds at police officers. He didn't have his hands in the air. He fired seven rounds at cops. He was white, by the way. Yet police managed to end the standoff with gas and other non-lethal means without killing the man. 
and now he was transported to a psychiatric center for evaluation and treatment. You know, when I look at the talking heads on TV, they're not talking about the fact that we have no money for the mentally ill who need this kind of help, and no mention is being made of the militarization of the police forces across the country uh, to de-escalate this kind of violence. When you give them military arms, they act like they are stormtroopers, as you can see very clearly throughout the country. So problem, reaction, solution, they use this, of course, to get, uh, get rid of the gun laws, to test out their uh, robot killings on Americans, and, of course, to try to stir up a race riot. All right, let's get some more stories in. I mean, today's news is unreal. I feel like it's the 60s all over again. Anger and dismay and the nation's attention after a violent I-94 shutdown. A dramatic protest Saturday on Interstate 94 in St. Paul turned violent with 21 police officers injured, more than 100 people arrested. Under occasional clouds of colored smokes, fireworks, rocks, and tear gas, the confrontations went on till 4.30 in the morning on Sunday, and this was the uh, demonstrations against the killing of Philandro Castile. Just a few hours later, St. Paul's mayor and police chief denounced as a disgrace the pelting of officers with rocks, bottles, and other items, just like Obama does, just like Loretta Lynn does. But no attention, of course, being paid to the fact that so far they've killed over 571 Americans this year alone. Uh, anyway, they said 21 officers from all law enforcement agencies were injured in the mayhem. One of them with a broken vertebra, still in the hospital. They say six of the 21 were troopers who were hurt by thrown objects. And it drew national attention. It actually drew international attention. Obama weighed in, saying at a news conference that any violence directed at police officers is a reprehensible crime. Well, when you don't have any justice in the criminal justice system, why isn't he addressing that? Like I've said many times, he's been president for eight years. He's done nothing for the black Americans. Zero. He also said, wherever those of us who are concerned about failures of the criminal justice system attack police... You're doing a disservice to the cause. Well, what service are you doing to the cause? They never look in the mirror. Anyway, <clears throat> Philandro's mother, Valerie Castile, said, when demonstrations become violent, it disrespects my son and his memory. My son was a man of peace and dignity and asked people to stay peaceful. So let's go take a trip to uh, the land of no justice. It's like the Bill of Rights and the Constitution really have been burned. And when people get disgusted, well, when you got nothing left to lose, you fight like you got nothing left to lose. It's like guerrilla warfare on the streets of America. Let's go to uh, South Dakota. South Dakota police officers are strapping people to beds and having catheters forcibly inserted into their urethras in order to extract urine from them, according to attorneys. Attorneys for a man from Pierre charged with felony drug ingestion who's asking the judge to throw the evidence out from the involuntary urine sample said that. State prosecutors say the practice is legal. Many disagree. Dirk Sparks said his constitutional rights were violated following a report of a domestic disturbance. When they took him into custody, a judge signed off on a search warrant for Pierre police to obtain blood or urine after they said Sparks had become fidgety. Well, if you were arrested, you'd probably become fidgety too. Well, when he refused to comply voluntarily, the cops brought him to a hospital, strapped him to a bed, while a catheter was forced into his penis so a urine sample could be extracted. Think about this. This is like another form of rape in the land of the free where everybody was waving their flags on the 4th of July. Sparks was charged with obstruction, two counts of felony drug ingestion, and possession of marijuana and drug paraphernalia after his urine tested positive for THC and methamphetamine. Well, THC will stay in your system for months, so what does that prove? Anyway, attorneys for Sparks argued that forced catheterization wasn't explicitly authorized by the judge in the warrant for blood or urine, meaning that Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable search and seizures were violated. 
And yet Americans still sit back and just think this is the way it's supposed to be. So let's go to Baton Rouge where there were plenty of protests this weekend. But think about no right to privacy on your own property. When Baton Rouge cops barged into a woman's yard to arrest Black Lives Matter protesters that she invited into her yard. They were in her yard on private property. Uh, She invited them in to hold the rally on her property. But that didn't stop the cops from coming in like stormtroopers and arresting dozens of them. She was smart enough, as usual, to video, especially if you're black, you better have a camera attached to your head. The woman who hosted the protest said she was stunned after cops moved on to her property and told protesters to disperse. Some of them did leave and moved on to the sidewalk where they were immediately arrested because the cops in minority report thought, thought crime, that, oh, we better arrest them before they go block the highway. The homeowner said that she was very upset. She says, I'm stunned at the behavior of police officers that utilize the ability to take someone that I guess they targeted that was actually on the street to bombard my yard and bombard my house. The protesters had been peacefully protesting on our property for over an hour and a half when officers in riot gear started moving in. And that's when protesters started yelling at the cops that they were trespassing on private property. Well, that didn't mean Jack. I guess they were lucky they didn't bring in killer robots. The police justified their aggressive behavior by claiming protesters had been planning to march down to the highway and form a blockade. Remember, they practiced for that in Boston with that Boston bombing staged event. And that's when shelter in place came and when they can just come into everybody's house looking for terrorists. And it happens like the frog in a pot of boiling water. It's like a slow death to democracy. This story off The Guardian in the UK, this is how the world is looking at us. Police begin a nationwide militarized crackdown in the wake of Dallas shootings. Military-style vehicles, tear gas, and smoke grenades returned to American streets for the first time this summer, and Barack Obama appealed for calm and said that those who attack law enforcement undermine the cause of social justice. We have no social justice in this country. This is like, (laughs) that's an oxymoron. The unrest built as authorities in Dallas said Micah Johnson, who opened fire on the cops last Thursday, had been plotting a wider bombing campaign that could have had devastating effects. Here comes the backstory. He was said to have been seeking revenge for the police's treatment of African Americans. Protesters complained they were being denied their rights to peaceful assembly. In cities across America, police are responding to peaceful protests with provocation, violence, and unconstitutional arrest, said Samuel Sinyagwa, a prominent activist with the group Campaign Zero. Dozens more protesters, actually hundreds, were detained by police during protests in New York, Chicago, Atlanta, Baltimore, and Phoenix, where police used tear gas and pepper spray to disperse crowds. Uh, And this is America 2016. And no good deed goes unpunished because the cops will get back at you for filming their executions of Americans on the street. Chris Lede, the man who shared the video recording of the Alton Sterling shooting, was arrested less than 24 hours after he shared the footage on false charges of assault and battery a move he said was an act of police retaliation for posting the video. And that's what they do. They make you pay. Mark Ash, who is the editor of Rita Supported News, wrote a good piece this morning. He calls it, I blame the police. He says, I want to be very clear. What happened in Dallas this week wasn't just a despicable act or an attack on democracy, as some have categorized it. It was a direct consequence of an unprecedented campaign of lethal force applied by law enforcement agencies across the country. U.S. cops kill. They kill at a rate unparalleled anywhere else in the world. The killing exceeds that of any domestic nationwide police contingent in history during peacetime. These are not Praetorian-style security forces, shadowy death squads, or uninformed police acting at the behest of drug lords. They're fully sanctioned, state-sponsored, civilian police forces functioning in a supposedly democratic state. 
and the numbers are staggering. Private media accounts, because they're the only ones available to the public, put the number of people killed by U.S. police so far this year at 571, as of this writing, and it doesn't happen anywhere else in the world and never has. Micah Johnson, who attacked the police with an assault rifle, was the 566. Five more people have been killed by U.S. police since the events in Dallas. This, according to The Guardian in the U.K.'s ongoing landmark investigation called The Counted, people killed by police in the U.S. The truth is U.S. police are trained to kill, not just maim, womb, or subdue, kill. The problem is systemic from the highest echelons of government right down to the cop on the beat. Kill when you need to kill. We've got your back. There are a number of initiatives in the U.S. to promote training to teach police officers to de-escalate potentially violent situations, which they call de-escalation training. It's a good idea that will fail. As long as police officers are confident that they can kill with impunity, they will continue to kill. Make no mistake about it, today in America, police kill with impunity. Not until police officers are consistently held accountable by the justice system will the appalling number of killings decline. If you grieve for the slain Dallas police officers, that's perfectly reasonable. They were murdered and taken from their families horrifically. They were human beings and deserve human dignity in life and even more so in death. However, if you can't find the courage to expend that respect to the people killed unnecessarily by police, then you're procreating the conditions that led to Dallas. <clears throat> okay, this off uh, World Socialist website, their take on the murders going on in this country, outright executions, race, class, and police murder in America. In the aftermath of the mass shooting of police officers in Texas, the American media and political establishment has sought to portray the police killings of unarmed people and widespread protest against police violence as proof of deepening and unabridgeable racial div divisions in the U.S. This presentation is grotesquely at odds with reality. What's taking place in America isn't a race war, but rather public protest against police violence in a country where more than a thousand people a year are executed without trial by police forces run amok. Racism, of course, exists. It may be a factor in many police killings. Blacks are targeted for police attack in numbers disproportionate to their share of the population. But the facts themselves demonstrate the scourge of police violence and murder isn't limited to blacks or minorities but extends to working people and youth of all races and ethnicities, especially the poorest and most vulnerable sections of the working class. The claim, made without either factual substantiation or historical explanation, that the U.S. is suddenly convulsed by sectarian hatred, is a falsehood that doesn't withstand any serious analysis. It's being promoted as part of a narrative that serves definite political interests. Always ask who benefits. This, this presentation conceals the nature of the state and distracts attention from the fundamental questions of social class that are at the root of the relentless exercise of police brutality and murder. The wave of state violence takes place under specific conditions, a deepening economic and social crisis, an immense growth of social inequality, mounting signs of a resurgence of class struggle, and a broad process of political radicalization within the American working class. I'd like to say those are the only nasty stories I have for you today, but I can't say that because I've collected a lot more. All right, let's get over to the UK briefly. Theresa May is set to become Britain's prime minister because no one else wants the job. She's be the second woman to hold the job after a rival quit the race. She's a 59-year-old Home Secretary. She's likely to be the next Prime Minister of Britain after her only rival for the job, Andrea Leedsom, abruptly pulled out of the race Monday. She was the Energy Minister and under widespread criticism after suggesting in an interview that being a mother made her better qualified to run the country than Miss May. <laughs> People are so stupid. Anyway, we'll see what happens over in the U of K. All right, some earthquakes since Thursday, this morning near the coast of Ecuador, 
Yesterday, the Samoa Islands had a 6.0 and Tonga had a 5.5. John Curacao, uh, a whistleblower who rotted in prison for telling the truth, he writes a lot for Rita Supported News, calls our prisons the Department of Retribution, and that's what they are, torturing the mentally ill. He said, there are times when I wonder if the various state and local departments, justice, corrections, and rehabilitation, that deal with prisoners should be renamed the Department of Retribution. What they're doing has little to do with corrections or rehabilitation, especially when it comes to inmates with mental illnesses. But we have no money to treat our mentally ill, so we just throw them in prison or shoot them dead in the street. That's what they remember that one police chief who defended his murderous cops by saying they did what they're trained to do. Remember that. All right, more women are coming out of the woodwork accusing Fox News' CEO Roger Ailes of sexual harassment. Sounds familiar like a Bill Cosby uh, deal. And this is what you need. One woman comes forth and all the rest will get the courage to come forth. Okay. In recent days, more than a dozen women have contacted Carlson's New Jersey-based attorney, Nancy Smith, and made detailed allegations of sexual harassment by Ailes over a 25-year period dating back to the 60s when he was a producer on the Mike Douglas show. God, what a world we live in. Okay, as live streaming of these violent events become more common, how are social media companies handling it? You know, more people get their news now on social media. And uh, even though people say, why did that woman so calmly film the aftermath of her boyfriend getting shot in the seat next to her? Because they're trained to do that. It's the only thing you can do. You can't move. You can't speak. You better just start filming. <clears throat> the aftermath of the police shooting of Castile, 32, broadcast to the world when his girlfriend used a Facebook live feed to document the traffic stop, which, by the way, originally they said it was because he had a broken taillight. But uh, when you hear the, uh, the radio of the cop, he pulled him over because his nose was too wide. In other words, because he was black. Anyway, Castile's date, the death was, as of then, the latest in the string of police-involved shootings of African Americans. But it's part of a new trend now, live streaming violent events. And social media trying is being scrutinized for how they handle it. Facebook put it up, then they took it down, then everybody already put it back up. But it also is highlighting the fact live video is an important new vehicle for communicating news events and especially instances of police brutality. Camera phones have captured countless police-involved deaths. Uh, and even with Alton Sterling, it was filmed by a bystander, Mike McClanahan, and uh, he said, thank God for the iPhones, because without iPhones, they might have gotten away. Live streaming is different because it emotionally thrusts the viewers into the moment of the event with a heightened sense of awareness as it unfolds. This became mainstream when Ferguson protesters used streaming to document police response following the shooting of Michael Brown. It's also unpredictable and, as uh, one broadcast depicted, can show graphic and potentially offensive material. Reynolds' Facebook Live video was removed for about an hour, possibly because users reported its graphic nature, but Facebook contends the video was accidentally removed due to a technical glitch and then put the video up with a violent content warning once the error was identified. We need to see all of this because otherwise seeing is believing and they still get away with murder, even with the film. The question of how to handle graphic content is more pressing now that 62% of Americans get their news from Facebook and the company has actively moved its focus towards media. Facebook's opened its platform to publishers and embedded a strong video presence now enhanced by the use of live streaming video. And I see that as a good thing. Remember, all the tools they use to spy on us are tools we can use to spy back on them. Of course, we are as militarized and don't have the kind of weapons that cops are using against us for traffic infractions, but at least we can do the best we can. Anyway, I'm going to go to a short break. Got lots more news. Stay with me. 
This was just a small sampling of today's new show, which actually ran an hour and a half at New York Speed Talk. If you'd like to hear the rest of the news and, and avail yourself to the hundreds of hours of education in my archives, please go to my site, maria.net, M-E-R-I-A, and subscribe. You will never regret it. Thank you.